The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferrens. Workers at Boeing prepare a strike vote. Meanwhile, machinists get a seat at the table in Congress looking into unfair Chinese competition. And today on the show, the latest from the American Federation of Government Employees and the North Coast Labor Federation. Welcome to the Thursday, July 18th edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. We have two guests on the show today. We're going to start things off with David Can. David is a union organizer, a labor lawyer, and a union educator who has been working to help unions grow their power for over 20 years. He is the director of organizing for the fastest growing big union in the United States. And I'm talking about the American Federation of Government Employees. Now, they currently represent 750,000 federal and D.C. government workers. However... They are not all dues-paying members. That's how it works in the federal government. Right now, they are just shy of 300,000 dues-paying members. Actually, the number I have in front of me, and David might correct me on this, it's 298,101. That is a 5.5% increase from 2022 going to 2023. That being said, the AFGE family has embarked on a campaign called Drive to 325. Drive to 325, 325,000 people they want by the end of this year. And if you go to the national website, afge.org, you can help them do that. And David is going to spell it out. That's right. AFGE number one last year, followed by the machinists. They were up uh, 3.7%. The firefighters up 3.3%. My union, SAG-AFTRA, they were up uh, 2.1%. And the plumbers and pipe fitters last year jumped by 2%. So David is going to talk about this campaign. It's very, very well coordinated. It's member to member. And uh, he's going to give us the specifics. And I want this to be kind of a lesson. we got a lot of listeners to the show that are probably thinking, well, what are they doing over at AFGE that I can do in my union? So pay attention to what David has to say. By the way, you got to salute the uh, American Federation of Government Employees, not just here, but what they're doing in Europe. And uh, there's one local in Europe that can grow by 50% federal employees working for the U.S. Army at two locations in Germany have voted to join AFGE, part of a continuing effort to expand their representation of federal employees working in Europe. I'm sure uh, David will touch on that as well. Davida Russell will be joining us later in the show, and I love talking to this woman. She wears so many hats, and she just started another organization She is currently a councilwoman for the city of Cleveland Heights, Ohio. She's also the state president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women, or CLU, vice president of the Ohio AFL-CIO, state executive board member and president of the Northeast Ohio District of the Ohio Association of Public School Employees, OAPSI, which is part of AFSCME Local 4. She also serves... As Executive Secretary Treasurer of the North Coast Area Labor Federation and a trustee of the Cleveland North Shore Federation of Labor, which is part of the AFL-CIO, Davida, she has been in the forefront of organizing, educating, training, increasing political awareness among workers, campaigning for pro-labor politicians. That is so darn important. 
and she's been doing this uh, her entire life. And recently, she started an organization called the Ohio Alliance for Community Education and the Ohio Alliance Action Fund. Here's the website. You might want to check this out later in the day. Ohio Ace, Ohio A C E dot O R G. This is a group, it's a nonprofit, and it's designed to engage the community, inform citizens about the issues that affect their lives, and most importantly, empower them to participate in voting to bring about necessary policy changes. You want changes? Make sure you're registered to vote. You heard me say elections matter on the show so many times, and that is so darn important. So she'll talk about all of that. She also has a uh, barbecue fundraiser coming up in uh, August. She'll talk about that as well, and that's to support the Coalition of Labor Union Women, which she'll get into detail on as well. So Davida Russell, on behalf of one of our great sponsors here, the North Coast Labor Federation, will be joining us later in the show. Now, a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by the good folks at Boyd Watterson Asset Management. $17 billion in assets under advisement. You can find more at boydwatterson.com. Boeing workers in Seattle are preparing for a strike. Union leadership say they hope a strong turnout, which started yesterday for the vote, will send a strong message to Boeing and the negotiating committee. Nearly 30 thousand union workers are eligible to vote to authorize a strike when their contract expires, which is September 12th. Their negotiating committee aims to win a 40% raise in their historic negotiation, the first for this group of workers in 16 years. While we're talking about the machinists here, the uh, IAM's Eastern Territory General Vice President, David Sullivan, and resident general vice president Jody Bennett recently testified before Democratic members of the Select Committee on the Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. The committee was interested in hearing labor leaders' views on the bipartisan report Reset, Prevent, Build, a strategy to win America's economic competition with the Chinese Communist Party. Now, that report was actually issued late last year, and it included about 150 policy recommendations for Congress. Well, the good news is this. Both Sullivan and Bennett, and this happened this week, were able to communicate the IAM's most important interests and objectives. And this is what Sullivan had to say. The IAM, the machinists, were ready to build and maintain our 21st century naval and commercial fleet. We remain steadfast in our devotion to that goal, and we urge lawmakers to work with us to bolster and reinvigorate this vitally important domestic industry for the sake of long-term U.S. economic and national security. IAM members face issues like cyber espionage, risk to critical infrastructure, and China's human rights abuses. This hearing focused on the most pressing job-related concerns highlighting areas that needed more action, and the machinists applauded the Congressional and Biden-Harris administration's efforts to CHIPS, the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, export controls, and other issues. And Bennett went on to say China continues to use every tool available to establish a strong aerospace industry And they're doing this at the expense of U.S. workers. The U.S., he said, needs to immediately find more effective ways to stop China from using market-distorting activities like curbing the transfer of technology and production. China's commitments in the 2020 Phase 1 agreement did not resolve many of these concerns about forced transfers and other what he called market-distorting practices. So if you get an opportunity, if you want to go online, you might want to check out that report, Reset, Prevent, Build, a Strategy to Win America's Economic Competition with the Chinese Communist Party. This is something that's so darn important. We've had many discussions 
over the years with the Alliance for American Manufacturing on how China is affecting the United States and how they are, they're pretty much an unstoppable freight train right now. We have to do something. It's good to see that the unions are trying their best at this. And one more here. President Biden has selected Deva Kyle, who comes from a union side law firm called Cohen, Weiss and Simon to head the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, an agency that ensures and oversees union pension plans. The PBGC, as they call it, has been under increasing scrutiny over its dispensation of pension bailout money, which was authorized for the first time ever in 2021 in the American Rescue Plan. So we'll see uh, if he uh, makes his way to the PBGC. I know there's going to be some opposition, as there usually is in the halls of Congress. All right, we're going to take a quick break. David Can, on behalf of the American Federation of Government Employees, what are they doing with regard to organizing? That story coming up next. This is America's Workforce. It takes LIUNA to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of LIUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with LIUNA. Find out what it takes for LIUNA to keep America running at LIUNA.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the U.S., US, Canada, Canada, and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans, and we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers, and we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot O-R-G. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. America's Workforce Radio is sponsored in part by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council 6, representing painters, glazers, drywall finishers, and sign and display industry workers. They remind you that belonging to a union is your right as an American. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit BACWeb.org. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at Liuna.org. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the United Labor Agency, ULAgency.org is their website. Before we get to a David Can on behalf of the American Federation of Government Employees, we're going to talk about all the great organizing that they have done. But uh, another victory here for AFGE. It was a major victory for the unions and members, a congressional attempt to strip, that's right, strip 32,000 National Guard dual status technicians of collective bargaining rights and workplace protection did not advance in the House of Representatives during consideration of the annual defense authorization bill. 
an amendment offered by Representative Austin Scott out of Georgia to the fiscal year 2025 National Defense Authorization Act would have reclassified National Guard dual status technicians as military personnel, not federal civilian employees. And under that amendment, the dual status technicians would be employees of the National Guard under the authority of the governors, not civil service. And that means the loss of collective bargaining rights for the technicians. Well, guess what? The amendment, however, was not voted on because of AFGE's active outreach to House members of both parties explaining the reasons for its strong opposition. Just one more example of what a powerful union like the American Federation of Government Employees can do for you as a worker. So that is so much appreciated. All right. Speaking of the AFGE, let's go to our live line from Washington. David Can joining us, who is the director of organizing, and they are kicking some butt when it comes to organizing. And uh, I stand corrected. You're over, what, 300,000 now, David? Is that right? That's right. We uh, we set the goal as we uh, try to try to get to our uh, new high, and uh, we beat our goal by about about four months. We passed 300,000, and we're still climbing. I like that. It's all part of the drive to 325, and as I indicated at the top of the show, the American Federation of Government Employees, when you take a look at the, the unions, the major unions, top 20 unions, they are number one when it comes to growing their membership. Uh, last year, a 5.5% increase. So, David, I want this to be kind of uh, labor 101 because what you're doing <laughs> at AFGE, I want all unions to do that. So if you and, and look, I know there's probably a few things you don't want to share with us, but whatever you can share with us is so would be really, really good for the people listening to this show. So talk to me about it. It's all yours, buddy. Well, that's 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 a, a kind framing. I appreciate it. One, I'll say um, in, in in tribute to uh, the late Jane McAlevey, um, everything we're doing, and this is something she used to say when she wrote her books and, and gave gave her lectures. Everything we're doing is not new, um, and it's sort of in in the spirit of of labor. It's it's collective. We're we're borrowing what's worked for other folks, and, and we're we're applying it. And it's it's fundamentals. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. I've, I've I've bothered a lot lot of other labor unions, asking them about what they do it works as well. Um, so it comes down to making sure that the 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 growth and the recruitment and the organizing and the visibility, all of which are different activities, but uh, are interwoven when you do them right, belong to the locals and the members. Because no matter how many staff you have. No matter how many lobbyists, no matter how, how, how many organizers, how many reps or business managers, they can't do the business of the union. They can't do the business of growing the union by themselves. Um, I remember I used to have uh, a coworker who used to give union trainings, and he'd always have a picture of an iceberg with just the tip crusting over the, the water line. And then the, the majority of it underneath. It said, if you think of union leadership and you think of union staff and you think of union activists, that's only the tip of our power. And what we're doing is if we don't, if, if we try to be a business model union or a service model union, we're leaving all of our power, all of our capacity untapped. And so the goal of a union should always be to mobilize as much as possible. And again, I, we're not the only ones who have done this. If you look at Ask Me Strong from a few years ago, it's exactly the same model. Um, it's the idea of making sure that you're turning over the growth of the union and the ownership of the union to the, the the members themselves. And that's exactly what Draft to 325 is. That's what we've been doing that's been making a great difference. So, you know, we've had previous initiatives where we've asked folks to contribute to the growth, but Draft to 325 is the idea that all of the members and all of the leaders and all the activists are the ones in the driver's seat. And, you know, our growth of, you know, has been, been, been pretty evenly spread through all of the districts and all of the locals. And so in the Draft to 325, we're asking each local to make a commitment to be a part of that growth. And then what we have, instead of just saying, you know, they've made a commitment and a pledge to the local, they've made a pledge to each other. And we have a leadership circle where the people that are interested in being a part of that growth, and it's an extraordinary amount, create a cohort where they talk to each other about what works and what doesn't. And, you know, we're happy, we weigh in and we share lots of tools and lots of resources and lots of support and our organizers are in the field working. We, um, we, we track a lot of data. 
um, the amount of events that our organizers have been able to participate in has tripled over the past year and a half um, because the, the the locals are active. And so when they're in these cohorts and talking about what's working and what's not, it builds incentives, it builds buy-in, it builds ownership, it, it, it builds a, a space where people are sharing ideas collectively. Um, and I don't know if you've ever uh, talked to Bill Fletcher, um, who's an AFGE alum, also comes out of SEI, you worked with the AFL for a good long time. He used to talk about the benefit of having leaders talk to other leaders who have similar positions so they can build community and trust and workshop ideas and understand that the experience of other folks that do similar work creates a space where they can talk about talk about the work. And so we're doing that in the Drive to 325 cohorts. And I think I think folks folks are going to get a lot out of that that environment and and again feel ownership of the growth. Um, and we're, we try to do a lot of that. We've got our convention coming up, and uh, we've always made a, a real effort. And I think other unions do this too. Made a real effort to recognize just the unions that grow by the, the most members, but also by those that grow by the, the greatest percentage. Because you know you've got enormous locals like the VA, TSA, um, Border Patrol that grow a ton. You have smaller locals that are in uh, smaller areas like uh, Social Security Field Services or Department of Energy folks. Um, where they're, they're they're spaced out, or they're sort of by, by by nature of geography, smaller locals that are doing a lot of really great work and need to need to need to be recognized and need to share their success stories with one another so they can grow from it. And so I think those are the fundamentals, I guess. But there's a lot more to the practice. Oh, I, I'm sure there is. Which we're we're eager to talk. About. <laughs> I like that. The drive to 325. By the end of the year, do you have a date on that? I mean, is it possible to do this by the end of this year, 2024? Uh, well, <laughs> it might be possible. Our goal is by the end of 2025. Okay, okay. Um, and and we, we think we can do it. Um, and it, it 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 comes down to making sure the tools and the resources are in the hands of locals. Um, we've got 30 national organizers who are out there um, doing incredible work. But uh, I, th- I think I think I think the model works best when the organizers and the practitioners sort of think of it as being a basketball coach, because if you've got 400,000 people to talk to. 30 organizers can't do it, um, but 300,000 members can. Um, and so it's, it's, it's about putting, putting the, 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 the power in the hands of the members. Um, and it's about having the philosophy of union governance and union strengths, not just be in collective power of, 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 of in the effects of the way that we, we run our union, but in, in the way that we, we organize as well. Um, so we're, we're trying to put the, 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 the tools to, to, to grow in the hands of every single member of AFG. And, uh, so far it's been a bit of a success and we're, we're hoping it will continue. Well, definitely it's a success. No doubt about that. Here's the crazy thing. And you and I have talked about this before. AFGE actually represents, what is it? 750,000 members. That's right. And here's the issue. They're not all dues paying members because that's the way it works in the federal government. Is that your target right now? Bring them over and say, Hey, you know what? Let's make our union stronger. Is that part of the strategy? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, because, the, 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 the way the, the, the law is, everybody that's covered by the contracts is covered by the union. So everybody's benefiting from all the terms and conditions of employment that are negotiated by the members. Everybody's benefiting from representation furnished by the staff and the members. But the problem is, if you're a member of a bargaining unit, and you're, but you're not a member of the union, you've got someone else deciding what the terms and conditions of employment are. You've got someone else deciding what the priorities of the union are. And at the end of the day, you're going to fare better than if you didn't have a union. But it's the same position as if an employer were deciding what you yeah. do and what you don't. Everybody has different needs. Everybody has different workplace issues. Um, every, I, I heard somebody at work say recently, uh, use the term called the Sunday scaries, which I think, I think may be a, a young people term, but I like. It's, it's you know, whether or not it's, it's having, uh, you know, a parking lot that's not safe when you leave work at night or a boss that's unfair to people and, and giving their fishing buddies all of the... Uh, all the, the the good PTO, or it's uh, not taking staffing seriously and having having people, uh, you know, not be able to keep up with the mission of the agency. Everybody's got different workplace issues that bothers them, and they carry those around. You have to push them down because you can't do your job if you have those at the top of mind. So you have to push them down into the pit of your stomach. But when 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 not everybody gets weekends off, but when you're whatever your Sunday is when that comes, that that rises up and it 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 eats at you. And the job of an organizer 
is to talk to every single member and find the thing that they care about. And it's going to be different. You know, we got we got 450,000 members of the federal and D.C. government that aren't members yet. You got 450,000 different issues that bother folks. You got to say, you tell me the thing that, that, that you want to see fixed, because I guarantee you, it's not the same thing as everybody else. And right. if you want to see that addressed, if you want the your union to be to be addressing the issues you care about, you've got to join, you've got to get involved. And, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're having more strengths because of that. You know, when you looked at the national guard, uh, uh, legislation we fought off. That was because all of the members that are a part of the National Guard and, and their brothers and sisters throughout the Federation stood up and said, this won't do. Um, if, if if the people in the National Guard weren't active and weren't members, we would have lost that battle. And that, that's true for every every single victory we have on the Hill. Yeah, and that was 32,000 right there. 32,000 members, National Guard. That's exactly right. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. David Can joining us on our live line. He is the organizing director of the American Federation of Government Employees. Now, over 300,000 strong. It's the Drive to 325 campaign. More to come from David later in the show. We're going to check in with Davida Russell on behalf of the North Coast Labor Federation. Back in a few minutes. Don't go away. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferrans. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at cwa-union.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Steel Workers. Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the US, US, Canada, Canada, and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. Founded in 1887, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters represents the employees responsible for tirelessly constructing and maintaining the national rail system in America. For more than a century, the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees has proven they have what it takes to protect its members and meet the ever-changing challenges of the rail industry. Today, the BMWED continues to fight for job security, fair wages, better benefits, and safer, more modern work environments. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at boydwatterson.com. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at liuna.org. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferrens with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. When you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up, receive our shows on a regular basis, and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. Let's go back to our live line from Washington today. David Can joining us. He is the organizing director of the American Federation of Government Employees, one of the many proud sponsors of America's Workforce. Now, over 300,000 members and they embarked on the Drive to 325 campaign. And hopefully, well, we'll see what happens by the end of the year, but if they can get to 325 by the end of next year, that'd be great. Right now, they have 750,000 members, but obviously not all are dues-paying members. And, David, you, you brought up Jane McAlevey's name in the uh, the first segment of our conversation. And if you don't mind, I'd like to touch on uh, on what 
she stood for. We had her on the show. She came out with several books on organizing. In fact, we're going through our archives because I'd like to do a tribute to her. She passed away at the young age of 59 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the model that she talked about, and it's kind of similar to way President Biden has rebuilt the economy from the bottom up, not from the top down. And when you talk about the bottom up, we're talking worker to worker. And that's kind of the organizing strategy that we're talking about. Can you reference what she said and how it's working for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for bringing it back to that. Jane McAlee, we talked a lot about how there are, and she talked about there, how there are three main models of the way unions run. Uh, one is the service model where staff and uh, local or national leadership uh sort of get paid dues and in return for those dues provi provide a service um, so that, you know, you, you hear sometimes about how, how employers will third party the union and say, you know, you've got, we don't want to invite a union in and have them get in between our relationship. I can give you time off if you ask. I can give you a raise if you ask. But if there's a union, we got to ask them. And the AFL re CIO's research shows that's one of the most uh, uh, powerful ways that employers dissuade people from joining. And uh, it's, it's, it's not an accurate description of what a service model is, but we, we, we third party ourselves in the way our members think of us when we when we fall into that. And so she said there, there's obviously benefits to that. We you know unions provide great service, but the members don't own it. And then there's an, another version where um, unions put members out front and feature members and talk about member success and and put put a, a powerful gloss of, of, of member work. But they're not doing a good enough job of centering members and making sure they have ownership. And then there's the organizing model, which is what we're doing our best to adhere to. And um, again, I think a lot, a lot of unions do a great job of um, where the members make the decisions. The members decide what, what actions we engage in. The members drive the union. And that's our goal. Um, we, we were lucky enough to, to have Jane talk to our National Executive Council, uh, to work with some of our bigger bargaining councils and talk to them. And um, we're, we're trying real hard to take that lesson to heart. Um, I remember uh, probably five or six years ago, uh, I and some of the 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 the, the members from the, the national president's office went to Chicago to talk to the Chicago Teachers Union to talk about how they'd had success with having member driven actions and a member driven union. Um, and again, it's it's one of the things that's really wonderful about the movement that we're in is unions learn from other unions, and our success is collective, not just in in regards to our silos, in regards to the unions that we're in, but throughout the movement. AFG has been extraordinarily lucky, extraordinarily lucky in, in, in working with other labor unions and trying to trying to learn from them and, and share the strategies that they've had. And I think what the draft to 325 is, is a culmination of that and making sure that we're turning uh, the, 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 the biggest federal sector labor union over to federal and D.C. government employees to run and and to grow and to, to, to build it into the union that it needs to be, which is uh, a privilege to be a part of. Well, I say many times on the show, success breeds success. So obviously, you're you're getting some attention by the other unions. Is there a, a shout out here to some that are coming saying, "Hey, I like what you're doing here." Maybe you can name a couple of unions that you've uh, spoken to as a result of your success, David. Um, well, I'll, I'll say that we've had a, a chance to talk with a lot of folks, um, and again, most of the times, a lot of the time, it's been us asking for advice because I think, I think, I think that's. Uh, that that's the, the best way to do it. But we've we've had a chance to work a lot with AFME, a lot with the firefighters. Um, I mentioned the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, we've we have uh, great friendships with a lot a lot of federations that uh, I think you know we 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 all share in our success. Um, so I'd I'd say that it's a big community, and I'd like to like to acknowledge all the folks that we've worked with. Um, and I'm excited to see more of it. I understand too that you're doing a pretty good job in Europe, specifically in Germany. And I guess uh, from what I was reading earlier. There's one local there that could grow by 50 percent. I would assume that you were part of that. And I, I know labor law is a little bit different over there, isn't it? Uh, well, you know, the, the good news is that it is. But the good news is that for federal employees, it winds up all being governed by by the same same statute. And I'll say that uh, the credit to that belongs to the district that drove it. So I will say that I got to share the, the, the benefit of the growth. But uh, the, the work there is uh, belongs to them. Uh, and what it is, is wherever there are federal employees, uh, that that's they're they're a part of AFG's footprint or potential footprint. Um, the the what's ex, what's exciting to think about is our ability to grow internally is greater than our ability to grow externally based on how uh, potential union members are classified by the Office of Personnel Management. 
Uh, but there's a, a lot of opportunity in Europe. Um, and uh, District 14 has been a leader. Uh, they're, they're, they're the, what would otherwise be the D.C. area local um, has been a leader in organizing in Europe. Um, and they've stationed folks over there that are staff and they're mobilizing activists um, in existing units to continue to grow um, in Germany and Italy. And, you know, you mentioned uh, all the good work Biden has done. Um, we're in a, an exciting moment when people are understanding the power of their labor and understanding the power of unions and wanting to be a part of that. And that's happening all over. And Germany was no exception. Uh, so the the energy and the commitment um, came from the members. They were they were ready to grow. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's an old AFL CIO re- uh, research study that said um, any open shop could grow 10% if they just asked. Um, you know, 10% of people say the reason they've never joined is because they've never been asked. And uh, that's a, a big part of what happened in Germany. Was people were ready to go and uh, giving them the resources and the tools and the knowledge about how to organize and having the staff on the ground. It fell into place and we're excited to do more of that. We actually have a giant election coming up now in uh, Hawaii and the Indo-Pacific, Korea, Japan, Guam, um, wherever their uh, federal employees are. They're, they're excited to excited to have a voice on the job. And AFG is honored to uh, be that voice. And you're ready for them. I like that. All right, David, I have one more question for you, and I appreciate uh, your time here. I'm going to let you get back to organizing. I want to talk about politics. The previous administration was not very friendly to federal workers. I'll put that bluntly. And there's a chance that that administration may, may come back here. That's true. Does that play into what you're doing right now? Because I'm sure a lot of workers are kind of concerned of what may happen here in America. What's your what's your thoughts on that? This is the only way to prepare. And if if we were to wind up facing an unfriend, it would be quite a pivot going from the most pro labor administration in in modern American history to the most hostile again. But the only way you can prepare for an attack from an employer that had the power to strip you of your rights at work is by getting people power. Um, you can have success in the courts. You can have success based on you know. Uh, governmental regulations, but the only way you can win is in the street. So we need to count on having a membership that's mobilized and engaged and paying attention to what's going on and willing to show up in order to have any chance of success if we have a hostile administration again. Because last time they kicked us out of our offices, they took away the the the, the time that people were able to engage in representation, they engaged in massive retaliation against uh, union leaders. And we can't count on only having the mechanisms of power that are granted by the administration to represent and to, 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 to flex our muscles. We need to be able to have all of the members mobilized and engaged. And so the things that lead to organizing success are the same things that will lead to representational success and being able to fight back attacks in the future. Um, having all 750,000 members of the bargaining unit join up and get involved and get engaged and be willing to show up when it's time to time to have a, a fight. And um, I, you know, my, my, I'm optimistic that uh, when it comes when 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 the election is done, that won't be the case. But um, no matter what comes, AFG is going to be ready uh, to fight and to, to to grow and to make sure that federal government and DC employees have a voice on the job, whatever the conditions are. David Can, organizing director for the American Federation of Government Employees, national website, afge.org. Lots of good information there. I urge you to check them out and see what they're doing all around America, all around the world, actually. David, I'm going to let you get back to work. Thank you so much for uh, for coming to the table today and kind of like sharing your strategy. I'm sure a lot of unions are saying, boy, I like what they did. I want to do the same. So thank you so much for joining us. And let's let's do this down the road. OK, brother. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I really appreciate it. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Davida Russell is with the North Coast Labor Federation, and she is coming up next. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to build North America's infrastructure. From roads and bridges to schools and skyscrapers, the men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, build the projects we depend on. From constructing the Freedom Tower on the site of the former World Trade Center to untangling Washington, D.C.'s congested interstate, Lyuna members do the work that matters. Find out what it takes to be built by Lyuna at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. 
America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. Attention members of the Heat and Frost Insulators Union who are interested in traveling. Central Ohio has more construction projects on the books than anywhere in the U.S. Mega projects, large and medium-sized jobs are creating more work than our local 50 brothers and sisters can handle. Projects like Intel, the Honda LG battery plant, and multiple data centers for Facebook, Google, and Amazon offer union wages, overtime, and exciting incentives. Local 50 is seeking union travelers to meet the needs of its signatory contractors who can put you to work immediately. If you're a member in good standing and interested in the work opportunities in Central Ohio, visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF travel for more information. This portion of the show brought to you by the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. For more information, please visit BACWeb.org. The Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers are proud to be a title sponsor for America's Workforce Radio. The Insulators Union is leading the way in the mechanical insulation industry, fire stopping, and infectious disease control. Regarded as North America's energy conservation specialist, these professionals are known for their professional work and dedication. You can learn more about the Insulators Union at insulators.org. America's Workforce Radio is sponsored in part by the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council 6, representing painters, glazers, drywall finishers, and sign and display industry workers. They remind you that belonging to a union is your right as an American. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Iron Workers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. America's Workforce is presented by the Labor's International Union of North America. Feel the power right now at liuna.org. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. Let's go to line number two, and this is a segment we do each and every month with one of our sponsors, and that would be the North Coast Labor Federation. And Davida Russell works with Pat Gallagher. She serves as a vice president of the North Coast Labor Federation, one of the many organizations she's involved with. She's also state president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women, She's involved with uh, AFSCME, actually the Ohio Association of Public School Employees. Now, this is her month off, but she decided, and this is courtesy. You can blame Pat Gallagher for this. <laughs> I know you drive a bus. You're still driving. How many years now have you been driving a school bus, Davida? I mean, it's ridiculous. How long now? 42 years. 42 years. And on top of it, <laughs> on top of it, she is involved in another organization called the Ohio Alliance for Community Education and the Ohio Alliance Action Fund. The website is Ohio Ace, Ohio A C E dot O R G. If you don't mind, let's start right there because this is something new to me, certainly something new to our listeners. I'm going to let you uh, tell us what it's all about. Go ahead, Davida. Sure. We're the Ohio Alliance for Community Education, is a nonprofit that I started uh, during the pandemic, actually in uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, it became a 501c3, 501c4. Uh, I've done political work in the political arena around the state of Ohio for almost those 42 years <laughs> of being behind the scenes, um, helping people get elected, advocating for uh, labor issues, helping um, the community understand uh the issues around uh, voting and why they should be engaged in the process and how it affects them at the ballot box. And so I was encouraged to uh, create my own foundation because uh, people uh, listened. Uh, I was good at it. And I um, uh, go around uh, Cuyahoga County and different states to help people with voter registration and helping the African-American community understand the issues around voting and why it's very, very, very important that we pay attention to what's happening in our government and our surrounding areas to 
find out how these issues are affecting us in our everyday lives and in our communities and how that translates to the ballot box. So I created the foundation and um, we started off with a hip hop voter registration bus that goes around uh, Cuyahoga County and we help register African-Americans to uh, register them to vote as well as educating them on the issues around uh, the political arena and things that's going to affect uh, the African-American community and people of color. So far, how are you being received on this? And you know you got your work cut out for you here because uh, we're seeing so many attacks on voting, and it's been going on for years. Um, I'm just wondering, what, as far as the Ohio Alliance for Community Education, are you making an impact? Is there pushback? Talk to me about that. Uh, actually, uh, we're actually doing very good. You know, it takes a little while for new organizations to get started, get grounded, get on their feet. Uh, we put in for, you know, we have to apply for grants to get funded. Uh, we were fortunate enough to put in a Black Futures grant with the Cleveland Foundation. And instead of them giving us a grant, what they did was they gave us a six-week or six to eight-week cohort uh, with their organization to help ACE learn about strategies, uh, putting together a plan, a budget, and all of the things that we needed to do to create a foundation for the organization. So once we have completed that, now we have been out now raising and asking for funds to help fund uh, ACE. And we have been uh, very fortunate in getting funds from uh, three or four different organizations so far, including uh, uh, Ask Me to help uh, promote and to help do the work that we need to do in the communities of color. So anyone out there, anyone out there who wants to donate to ACE and help fund the organization to help uh, uh, Ohio Ace get the word out and educate the uh, people of color around voting, around uh, activism, around uh, educating them around the issues. Please feel free to go to our website and donate or contact me personally for uh, grant opportunities. And that website, by the way, is ohioace.org, ohioace.org. Davida, let me point out something here. It, it, it's very important. I, I know nonprofits, your your hands are pretty much tied. You can't choose sides. This is purely education about the issues. So-and-so stands for this. So-and-so stands for that. This issue concerns this. This issue concerns that. Am I correct in saying that? You are correct, partially. So Ohio ACE is a 501c3, which is issue-based, so th which is nonpartisan, where we only speak of issues. And we tell and talk about and teach what candidate is behind what issues so that the population or the community can decide for themselves on what issue affects them in their personal lives and how they should vote. The Ohio ACE also has an action fund, which is a 501c3, which is not partisan, where we can advocate for a different candidate or a particular candidate to help push a candidate over the finish line based on the issues that we support as an organization as and as a community. You are so smart. <laughs> you figured it out. You figured it out. Okay. We'll educate you and then we'll tell you where to go. I love that. <laughs> Good one there. Okay. Let's uh, let's switch gears here and talk about the Coalition of Labor Union Women. And I think uh, I think I need some more explanation. I know what it is. I think our audience probably needs to get a little more in depth on what the coalition is all about. You've been involved in this for, for many, many years. So I'm going to let you explain what it is and what you're doing. I guess you got a fundraiser coming up and we'll get to that. So go ahead. Yes. Well, the Coalition of Labor Union Women is a organization that I have great passion for. Uh, it is the only woman's union organization in the nation under the national AFL-CIO under the Ohio AFL-CIO, we are the only one, one, only one woman's union in the whole nation. And the Coalition of Labor Union Women is combined of all unions 
across the nation where all women come together to advocate for legislation around women, around children. They help to um, uh, engage and encourage women to run for office. They also help uh, women become leaders within the union and rise to a higher status within their unions. And we are very uh, political on a nonpartisan side where we advocate for the issues around women when it comes around voting and protecting the right of women. And obviously with an organization like this, you need to raise some money. Talk to me about the uh, the fundraiser that you have coming up. Sure. And most organizations that we deal with are all nonpartisan and all need funding to help the organization grow and to um, advocate for the issues that uh, women need to be advocating for to support each other uh, in the unions and in our community. So uh, Clue, Cleveland Northeast Ohio chapter, has a annual fundraiser, which started last year, which was a huge hit is an annual barbecue, which is coming up August, Saturday, August 17th from 1 to 5 at the uh, United Steel Workers Union Hall on Independence Road in Cleveland. And it's going to be an outdoor picnic. Uh, we have uh, the menu is fabulous. Um, you ha- actually get a uh, half a slab of ribs. You get a half a chicken. You get... Um, baked beans, coleslaw, you get corn on the cob, you get cornbread and a tossed salad. If you are a person who does not eat pork, you will get a whole chicken, uh, baked beans, coleslaw, uh, cornbread, corn on the cob, and a salad. And we also have uh, a menu for uh, people who don't eat meat at all. So um, the tickets are $40. Uh, per person. You can come and eat and party with us, or you can take a box to go uh, for your family. Uh, You can also purchase a table for $800, which include uh, adult beverages. And uh, we will be there from one to five on Saturday, August 17th. We're asking all people to come out and celebrate and join the Coalition of Labor Union Women, Labor Union Women, and support us as we Uh, fundraise and have a good time with the politicians and labor people uh, at the UAW, uh, USW Hall and Independence. Yeah, and the address for that is 3421 Independence Road. That's USW Local 979, their union hall. And this is the second annual barbecue for Cleveland's Northeast Ohio Coalition of Labor Union Women. Davida, we've got just about a minute left here. You know, this is a very politically charged year. I'm just wondering, how do you feel about going ahead to November? I know you got a lot of work to do, a lot of education, but in a nutshell, how do you assess it all? Well, I say we have a lot of work in front of us. Uh, that's why I'm, I've just come back from um, vacation, because I know uh, come August 1st, we will be hitting the grounds and we will be out trying to make sure everyone understands what is at stake at this election. You know, we say it all the time. Every election is the most important election of our lifetime. But I don't think people really realize sometimes that this election is not only the most important election of our lifetime. It is a life and death election of our lifetime. This can change the trajectory of the whole country if we don't come out and vote and we don't understand the issues and understand why we need to vote. It is so important, this election, and everyone needs to hit the ground as soon as possible. Come August 1st, everyone needs to be talking about this coming election and what we need to do to secure that we keep our democracy. Amen to that. Davida Russell, on behalf of the North Coast Labor Federation, that'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up tomorrow, the latest from the American Legion and the Alliance for Retired Americans. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful day. That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce radio podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com.